Today we're looking at ELT materials writing from a slightly different perspective. I'm going to be talking to the editor Penny Hands and we're going to be talking about the editor-author relationship and looking at things from the editor's perspective when they receive a manuscript or a document, maybe it's a course book, maybe it's worksheets, maybe it's a methodology article, and getting a feel of what the editor wants from the writer. We're also going to be looking at some research that Penny did a few years back where she interviewed editors and writers about what they wanted from each other. and Some of the findings are quite startling. Um, and we'll finish with some key tips for making that editor-author relationship work so much more effectively. Okay, so welcome to a, another interview connected with the topic of ELT materials writing. Today I'm talking to Penny Hands. Penny, can you just tell us about yourself? Yes, thanks for having me. Um, I'm um, an ELT editor mainly. I started my career um, teaching English in France and then came back to the UK to do a master's and ended up working for um, as a dictionary editor for about five years and then I went freelance and diversified and I work on all sorts of ELT materials including course books digital and print and teaching methodology and still do some lexicography when I can. So when we talk about the author editor relationship, we tend to be talking about the development editor because that's where there can be uh, friction. And just as in any relationship in the real world. Um, let's, um, let's explore the, the friction element with the developmental editor. What, would it, what do you think would make projects more effective in terms of how they begin? I mean, I think the starting process of of any new, particularly a long writing project, it's really important to get it right at the beginning. Yeah. Uh, and actually projects can go unnecessarily wrong, particularly in terms of communication between the author, the editor, and even the publisher, because certain things don't happen at the beginning. What, when you work on a project, what would you like to, ideally, what would, what would happen at the beginning? Well, I think ideally, uh, it's really nice to um, make sure that you've already formed the basis of the relationship with the author. Um, so if you can arrange for a Skype or a Zoom or something so that the author can see you, they can see that you mean well and that they're not gonna, they're gonna actually hear your cheery voice when they're reading the feedback that they get rather, because obviously it's very easy to read things in very different ways and uh, people may well read your comments in, a, in the wrong way. Um, obviously, a lot depends on the editor as well. There are ways and ways of, of presenting feedback, um, but sometimes you just do want to say to the author, this needs to be done this way, not this way. It's not a question of, um, I wonder if or whatever. And those sorts of comments can perhaps be misconstrued by a sensitive or even a normal, person who has emotions and feelings. So. I think it's interesting because a lot of us, we all come from teaching backgrounds in terms of ELT materials writing, and we know from having taught students the importance of those early lessons of rapport building and everybody in the class getting to know each other and establishing ways of communication in order for the lessons to work effectively. Yeah. But I'm almost, almost, almost sometimes struck in the... Um, the publishing writing process that we don't all take that classroom knowledge and apply it to projects that we work on and understand the importance of rapport building at the beginning Absolutely. that need to socialize and I notice a lot in publishing now with very thorough briefs which absolutely you need a document which states this is what the project is these are the aims these are the goals but a lot of that is dealt with at the beginning but there isn't as much time as there used to be i don't think spent on just having everybody meet get to know each other understand ways of working the yeah, I think the ways of working is also important, as important as uh, feeling comfortable with people, because if at the beginning you can talk about when, what the expectations are with regard to deadlines, how quickly you can expect somebody to get back to you, if you're in different time zones, or a lot of editors in-house are um, overloaded with several projects, and they don't always get back to people straight away. So if that's explained at the beginning, people know that they've got to wait at least 24 hours before they get 
they hear back from their editor. Um, other things like using track changes, what are the expectations there? Does the author want to see every change? Does the editor want to track every change? Um, so I think it's quite good to find some kind of agreement there as well. File naming protocols sounds quite boring, but it's really helpful for not getting in a tiz about what stage you're at and which. So there's, there's interesting things like file naming protocols are exactly the sorts of things that most materials writers are absolutely rubbish at and editors are really good at. So straight away you have those little bits of Mm. potential friction points yeah, if, you can, if you can sort it out beforehand and yes. also that thing with final version version two and final final this really is the final version <laughs> if you can work out a system whereby things all go in the right order in your file um reader thing on your computer that's really helpful as well yeah 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 um, let's um oh. let's just uh, as an experiment uh, I'm going to put a, a document on the screen and we're just going to talk about it. If you were an editor receiving this document, mm -hmm. we're going to talk about what would be your immediate concerns and how you might actually th deliver the feedback on it. So let's just put it up now. So what we've got on screen is a kind of, um, I've mocked up a slightly badly written beginning worksheet for a lesson. and. <clears throat> Obviously, we don't have a context, we don't have a brief for this, we don't know why it's been written. But if you were receiving this as an editor, what would be your immediate sort of reactions and concerns and how would you handle the feedback to the author? So we've got this worksheet called In the City. It involves some kind of listening. So there's an audio script just slightly further down. So the, the author's written an audio script, a conversation between a tourist and a woman the tourist is asking how to get to the shopping center and the women, woman is giving directions. Mm -hmm. And so the exercise is the author suggesting that there should be a photo showing a city scene because it's in the city. And then we've got exercise one, two, three. So exercise one is to sort of listen for, find out where the tourist wants to go. Then list, exercise two, the students are gonna listen and fill in the gaps. Okay. And then in exercise three, the students are going to practice using the language from the listening to give directions. But there's clearly a number of things wrong with it. Hmm. Okay. But from an editor's point of view, what would be your initial approach to this? Well, I think, obviously, as you say, we don't know the context. But um, I think if I did know the context and I knew the level and what the brief was, that would be my initial checking that the students would be, to be at the right level for the students to understand it. I mean, it seems uh, there doesn't seem to be anything very confusing here. So I don't think um, I would have to deal too much with the actual language. Um, let, it's not very advanced, but I think after that, once I'd established whether it followed that basic brief, I'd be looking at um, things like the photo brief, which I would suggest needed a little bit more um, detail. So <clears throat> imagine typically editors can use the insert comment function in a Word document. Yeah, with authors, this is fairly standard approach. So I've just opened up the comments. So you might write what in terms of the photo, what, what more information do you need from the author about this photo <laughs> choice? <clears throat> Quite often the designer <clears throat> isn't necessarily going to see any of um, what's going on behind the scenes with regard to the um, exercise. So um, a much more detailed art brief is usually required. So um, here it's obviously giving directions. So it would need to be um, a street view, I would have thought, rather than um, a, um, a cityscape, for example. You'd probably want to have people in that as well, which two strangers talking to each other and one of them maybe showing the direction to travel in. Okay, does it include people? So one person um, showing the direction, okay. Um, after that, I would probably uh, look at the first uh, rubric, listen to a tourist, where does he want to go? And then look at the actual, um, the transcript below and see 
well, what um, the students were going to hear. And you can see that the tourist is asking if there's a shopping centre near here. Well, that's the answer, isn't it? So then the student might turn off and not listen to the rest. So I think the idea would probably be to suggest that um, have a change of question or... Um, okay. You know, so this is Anne's third in the first sentence. You can't, really have the, uh, you can't ask where to go at the end. So it's going to have to be, right. question, isn't it? So we need to change the question. Then I would look at the gap fill and look at the rubric and see if that fitted with the rubric style of the rest of the material. Um, I don't know about everywhere in the world, but most of the books I work on, you usually put complete the text or complete the conversation. But anyway, that doesn't really Okay, matter. so that might be changed. So uh, you might put a comment like, check the brief, uh, yeah. use for the rubric, complete the text or whatever the rubric, whatever the, the brief recommends, yeah? Based on that. Okay. Um, and then I would look at the structure of the um, gap fill. And it strikes me that there's possibly too many gaps there for any students to be able to write and listen at the same time, unless it's self-study. Um, okay. Start and stop. Um, but yeah, I would recommend there that the author go away and chop about maybe 50% of those gaps. Okay, you um, say, okay, this is interesting. So you'd recommend it when I think we would both agree there are too many gaps here. So are we going to recommend it or are we just going to tell the author to do it? Because there's a this significant. Is one where difference. I think I would tell, not recommend. Okay. Um, I, would, I wouldn't just <clears throat> put a, <clears throat> excuse me, an imperative. I wouldn't say. Okay, well, that's what I'm interested because in, I'm writing these feedback comments as though I'm an editor and I'm just interested the way I'm writing at the moment. I've just written reduce the number of gaps. So, yeah. how, how actually would you word that as an editor? I would explain why. And uh, that's really important. That's one of the things that came up, came up in the um, survey I did. Okay, so uh, we'd, have, we'd have a sentence like the problem here is that dot dot dot. It can be, it can be like, it's quite time consuming, but it, it's worth it in the long run. Um, right, and yeah. then you might say, so can you reduce the number of gaps? So it's slightly more softened than using the imperative. Yeah, and I also probably wouldn't use the word problem. I would just say <laughs> one thing that, one good rule of thumb that I have I've been taught by somebody um, in house at OUP who gave me a really good sort of uh, mentor mentoring earlier on in my uh, career was that you have to always remember that you are talking about what is good for the reader or the student so if you can always say students might uh, struggle with this or students might not be able to do blah it takes that one step away from um, it appearing like they're trying to please you because that changes the relationship then between the author and the editor. If the, if the editor is always saying, I don't like this, or this is a problem, or um, even if they're trying to give positive feedback, I love this, that's not really helpful because you're not trying to please the editor. It's better to say, I think students will love this or teachers will find this really helpful because blah. And then it helps, really helps with the, um, the, the way the relationship between the author and the editor can develop because you see it more as a collaboration. Um, and yeah, you're that's, a, that's a really piece of great advice. I like that a lot. Yeah. And the way your the feedback is based around, well, how does this relate to the teacher and the student and, and putting yeah. it in there is, yeah, that's a really... So teachers might find this uh, tricky. Students might struggle to complete all of these gaps within the time available. Um, so I suggest that you blah. And then that's what um, another thing that the authors in my survey said, it's really helpful to put suggestions, um, suggested wording, suggestions for change, suggestions for new ideas, because one of the problems was that people were just getting a comment that was just, this doesn't work or 
uh, a question. My, in, in my own experience, one of the things I, I find is if, if somebody just sort of says, yeah, that's not going to work, you, and you think, okay, well, mm. you, you don't have to give me the answer, otherwise you could write it, but at least give me a pointer or suggest what possible yeah. alternative there might be. Yeah. I possibly won't use your alternative, but that suggestion will stimulate me to come up with another solution to it, yeah. I think that's important. Before we go over to the survey, and we will in a minute, because you did a survey some time back, just a quick question here. Um, little changes, like for example, clearly the gaps in that exercise have no numbering. So it should say yeah. one, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, any writer normally would put that in or remember to. But in that situation, would you just put the numbers in or would you tell the would you put it in a comment? These oh, well, at the beginning, if this was the beginning of quite a lot of material, I would probably do it and then add a comment saying, I've done this. Uh, please, could you remember that that's what we have to do at the beginning? In all that OK, way. so I've added the numbers, but please add, but please add them. From now on. From now on, for example, yes. Yeah, yeah. like and there are other things that I wouldn't even comment on, um, for example, um, spelling error, unless I thought it was something that they really should be able to, should know because they're going to be using it quite a lot throughout, um, or um, punctuation or a missing apostrophe or whatever. I wouldn't comment on that because I think that's one thing that people found quite annoying. Um, somebody said that often with junior editors who are less experienced, they were perhaps not uh, giving enough sort of developmental advice um you know we've all been there it does take a while to develop your skills throughout your career but in-house junior editors should really have somebody in-house checking over what they're doing and making sure that they're not literally just saying you could put an apostrophe here or I've, I've added this full stop because um that's not going to help the process really at all it just sounds pernickety and I think it also it did it, yeah there's that there's that element of experience and then it also comes back to that initial conversation at the beginning of the process on ways of working and how you're going to work on it and if you establish that then you move on quickly and yeah, I remember being in awe you know so 25 years ago thinking oh crikey you know I'm supposed to be editing Scott Thornbury or something and thinking well I can't can't tell him what to do but of course that's not what it's about at all you know so um you, you do really need a mentor at the beginning um to help you to keep looking back at the brief checking and making sure that you just put your yourself in the um, reader's shoes and then once you've learned that skill then there's still a lot you can offer to the most experienced of authors without it being awkward at all yeah let's um Let's take a look at the survey you did. Let's uh, take a look at a couple of the slides which report some of the feedback you got. So I did this survey of 66 authors and I split, I, I went through all of their feedback and um, extracted all the adjectives and put them into columns for what I assumed were positive and negative um, aspects of their feedback and put them into word clouds. And this was the result. So this was the positive one, obviously. And you can see that the, the most common word that came up was helpful. Um, and also, you can also see that support and supportive and collaboration figured um, very highly in that list. Um, what else can we draw attention to? Well-organized, sensitivity, um, honest, clarity and respect. Respect was another one, so mutual respect between the author and the editor. Um, there was a really nice comment from Tanya Patterson, who lives in Canada, and she's an editor and an author, and she said a lot of it is about um, feeling comfortable enough to challenge each other, but both of you being prepared to give way. Um, and I really like that. And I think that's really the way relationships work in all aspects of life, not just between an author and an editor. Um, and trust and uh, symbiosis, that was a good one. Um, anyway, so I'll move on to the negative one. Fortunately, it was a bit smaller, but 
here it is. And the most common word that came up was frustrating. And I think one of those reasons, one of the reasons for that was that people were finding that editors were being moved from projects, sometimes up to three times during a project, they'd get a different editor in house, or even freelance, actually. And the new editor didn't seem to know anything about what had gone on beforehand. So I think that's a really important point uh, for publishers there. Um, when you, uh, these things are inevitable. People leave, they have to go on maternity leave, they get sick, they um, get moved on to another project. They can't always be helped, but there does need to be somebody there keeping the new person abreast of what's happened before. Because if you make a change and then the new person comes and wants you to change it back and has no idea what was going on before, that's what's frustrating. It all seems to come back to the word communication, really, doesn't it? And that, that need to understand how you're going to communicate. And if there's a lack of communication, that's a problem. I mean, I had a book where the editor got changed and the new editor came in and we we were going, you know, heavily down the path of rewriting the whole thing because the sort of the the, the thinking behind behind the book was changing so much. And it, it's... They have their own agenda. And that was another comment that was made. You know, the editor is not the, the person who's in charge of it. And sometimes the changes come from the Ministry of Education where the book's being, being written for. And that's, that can be very frustrating as well. Um, but yes, the ed editor shouldn't have their own agenda or be a frustrated writer and trying to make it their book. So we've looked at what writers say about editors. You also surveyed editors and, and asked them yeah. to talk about writers. And I know that you got fewer responses, but what were some of the typical yeah. things? There were about 17 responses, but they led to some really interesting sub-threads. A lot of it is practical stuff. So um, they would like editors and um, authors to respect the deadlines, to follow the brief, uh, follow the template. I think that's really important, following a template, because it can be very frustrating for an author to... Can, you, can we just, for people who aren't involved in sort of big publishing projects, when we're talking about following the template, what are we talking about? Well, sometimes the publisher provides um, a template in Word, and it's basically you, you have to fit your material into it. Uh, so if it was a course book, it would say that you have to put the unit heading, um, the guy, the, um, what do you call it, the um, outline of aims of the unit, then um, the first exercise and the rubric, and then under the rubric, the questions, and it all has to be uh, formatted exactly the same way and work in the same hierarchy for each unit. And sometimes the author will, the um, publisher will provide um, that template and the author writes into it. And obviously, if you're working on a digital project, you haven't really got any choice because you're working on a, um, a digital template. Yeah. Um, anyway, if you're not working in this sort of digital template, it's really important that the author respects the fact that um, everything has to fit into this particular format. Otherwise, it won't fit on the page, for example, or um, you'll get exercises that don't seem to fit into the, um, the format that, of the previous units and things like that. So it's tempting for an author to do that because they might have some great idea that doesn't fit in with the style and the, the format. Um, and the editor has to try and work out how to uh, rectify that. Um, and one and lot of the editors said don't use loads of tables and tabs and fonts because that all has to be stripped out um, before it goes off to the typesetter. You have to use um, instructions like in red and square brackets or whatever. So if I'm creating a table um, and that's all going to have to be stripped out and that's annoying the editor, you're basically saying I need to open red square brackets and say we need a table here, three by six. Nowadays, I think in design and things like that, they can cope with a, a basic word table, actually. Okay. But um, yeah, more designy things uh, it's not worth bothering with because it's better to just say column one, blah, 
pun to or whatever. The only thing is, from a writer's perspective, I can see mocking it up on the page sometimes, picturing it, that's part of the writing process. And it makes it very difficult because you actually want to, you want to sort of picture how it's going to look on the page. And that's part of creating the material. You can't just, it's not just writing words in a disconnected way, it's actually or maybe even having a sketch of the image that's going to be on the page or, or, or somehow to, to get a feel of what the layout is going to look on the page. And that, that's quite a tricky balance, I think. Yeah, I agree. It's one of those things to talk about in the expectations part of the uh, project at the beginning, what you can and can't do. Yeah. yeah. I think within design, things might have changed a bit these days. Okay, so just to finish up then, let's think of, uh, just sum up what, what are the key points we need for the author-editor relationship to work, but also at the end of the day to produce a good set of material. So we talked about the importance of the brief at the beginning, <laughs> which is coming from the publisher, but the editor's the person who's got to sort of enforce it. Um, so clearly that, that setting out the brief clearly at the beginning is important. Uh, and I think we've agreed that, we, you know, the, the author and the editor, they need to meet, even if it's online, just to have a chat and establish a personal working relationship. Mm -hmm. That's right. And then really what it comes down to is um, <clears throat> the style of feedback that you give, understanding what you're doing when you're giving feedback, that you're representing the reader, um, and that there are different levels of feedback, and to make that clear to the author. Um, again, that's communication. Um, and nurturing a good relationship uh, throughout the project, offering support and always ensuring that your approach is collaborative. And establishing perhaps who's responsible for what in terms of feedback, like if, if you're going to quickly change editors and typos and stuff that's happening, or is there an expectation that the, the author actually needs to take more responsibility for checking those things early on, I, I guess, is part of that. Yeah, yeah. I think um, experience on the part of obviously on the editor's part only comes with time, but um, there are quite a few messages for publishers in all of this survey that they need to also be taking care to mentor their junior editors to make sure that when they change editor, what goes on behind the scenes is uh, pulling people in on what's happened already to uh, avoid this frustrating experience for authors not and on that them. that point about experienced authors inexperienced editors mm -hmm. i remember the time when i was an inexperienced author i really needed an experienced editor and i learned a lot from working with experienced editors who knew how to handle a new author and there is a difference in the in the, in the way of working so it works both ways as well i think thanks penny for all your expertise and time i hope you found that useful if you did then subscribe to the channel or also click on the playlist appearing on your screen now which will take you to a series of videos on the topic of elt materials writing